Greetings, y'all. All right, we'll start getting let everybody get a chance to come in and grab their tables, grab their drinks, have a sit down here at the Demon's Tea Room. Give everybody kind of a chance to come on in before we get up and started. Hey, Tammy. Chris Lord, my buddy Chris. What's up, Jen? Mr. Kyle. What's up, Jacob? Rachel, nice to see you. Welcome into the tea room. Yeah, no kidding, Chris. Chris Lord, ladies and gentlemen, also known as Ghost. You are not allowed to talk to Chris Lord because that man has stories I do not want to go out into public. Also, a big, huge shout out to Chris. He's on the front lines there of this stuff, doing what he does, uh, making sure and doing his best to make sure everybody goes home at night. Danny, Christy, what's up, y'all? Casey. Lisa, what's up, y'all? Miss Crowley. What's up, David? There's my lovely wife. She's here. Much love. Uh oh, she's in the room. I can't talk about her. That's never stopped me. What's up, Mike? One of my other tour guides, Miss Charmaine. Miss you, love you, stay safe, Charmaine. Paul. Hewitt, there's Master Hewitt. There's my buddy Blake. Dana Smith, welcome y'all. Miss Sabrina, much love, much love. All right, y'all, looks like we got about bunch of people coming into the tea room today i love to see it love to see it gives me a way to to talk to you guys and check on everybody out there so everybody welcome to the demon's tea room not your grandmother's cup of tea post-apocalyptic edition um so get started today um we have a new announcement last night evie and i sat down we and I've got a calendar in front of me. We're actually getting a little bit more um, organized on what we're doing. But we came up with different subjects for the day. So give you guys just a little little taste. We're gonna have Supernatural Sundays, Monster Mondays, Terror Tuesdays, Way Out Wednesdays, Throwback Thursdays, Forgotten Fridays, and Science Saturdays. So it gives us a chance to get all these stories into specific times and stuff like that and dates um, of what we're going to be doing. More for my sanity than anybody else. As Miss O'Malley, welcome y'all. Welcome, come in, grab a seat. So today, ladies and gentlemen, since this is Thursday, I think it's Thursday. Yeah, it's Thursday. Um, we're going to be going back to Throwback Thursday. So today... We're going to dive off into just a little bit talking and get you guys familiarized with the street we have here in town that used to be called Gallatin Street. And then off of Gallatin Street, we are going to take a walk right up past the Ursuline Convent to 616 Ursuline Street. And we're going to talk about and introduce you guys to the Velicavento Hotel. Now, before we dive off into the Villa Cavento, because I'm excited to get in, there's a lot of paranormal activity that goes on at the Villa Cavento and its history. And whether you guys have known it or not, you have heard of the Villa Cavento before, but we'll keep that for here in just a couple minutes. So let's jump back to Gallatin Street. Now, anybody who comes to the city of New Orleans, if you've gotten a chance to go down to Cater, down to the French Market, there where the U.S. Men is located, that two block area right in there that is today is known as French Market Place. Now this is where the French Market is set. The starting of it is technically 
right there at Cafe Du Monde. Once you just get past Cafe Du Monde, just about, that's French Marketplace. Now, back in the day, late 1700s, up into the early 1800s and into the late 1800s, around 1880, that street was known as Gallatin Street. And it was known to be, in the entire United States, the roughest two-block stretch of area of any port city in the continental United States. Keep in mind, it's right up there against the wall that is now the wall that is the Mississippi River. This was where the port was located. So all of these sailors and such coming into the Port of New Orleans, as well as travelers coming into the Port of New Orleans. There's one of our truckers keeping the, the lines open. You honk all you want, brother. Um, all of that human cargo coming in through the Port of New Orleans came on to Gallatin Street. Now, Gallatin Street was where a lot of the brothels were located, the gin joints, the whiskey joints. They actually have some names for the type of bars that are underneath a whiskey joint, the kind of places you just didn't really go into. Um, those were there. And then people had their apartments and lived in the houses above this area. Now, there was, this area was run by a gang, gang known as the Live Oak Gang. And keep in mind, law enforcement at the time refused to go into Gallatin Street if they didn't have to. It was said that if you could walk from one end of Gallatin Street from that two blocks to the U.S. Mint with your wallet and your life intact, God walked with you because it's the only way you were going to make it to the other side. Now, once you start diving off into the history of Gallatin Street, which is not that easy, keep it in mind, we don't change the name of anything in this city. This street was so bad, how bad? So bad that the city of New Orleans has gone out of its way to bury the history of Gallatin Street. Um, you have to do some real digging into the university archives and the city archives to find information on Gallatin Street. Um, like I said, it was run by a gang known as the Live Oak Gang, and it was very heavily Irish American that ran that street. And most of the individuals that ran those streets, what's up, Toast? Miss you, brother. Um, that ran Gallatin Street were ladies. There was a lady by the name of Coppertop, and we'll do a special live cast where we go into some of the stories of Gallatin Street, because that's a completely live, uh, live view conversation on just the stories of Gallatin Street. But Coppertop was, we believe, historians believe rather intently that she was responsible for at least four murders. Never went to jail for him. She did, I think, a max inside of the city jail for less than a week. Um, she was real close with the powers that be in the mayor, if you know what I mean. Um, just saying. And so, this woman was so bad, and she was so intense, that... It was said that she had a custom dagger made that was headed on each end. That she would have this dagger in her left hand and be pouring drinks with her right hand and able to stab somebody with each side of the blade and never spill a drop of the drink that she was pouring. Um, keep in mind, you're talking about 17th and 1800s Irish women. Oof. So we'll get deeper into those stories on another episode of the Demon's Tea Room because I'm, I'm kind of jonesing to jump into the Villa Cavento. So if you're walking up to Cater Street with me and we're looking at the French market, we take and cross to Cater, we take a left, we go up Ursuline just a wee bit. We're going to wind up, we're going to pass the Ursuline Convent right there on our right, home of our vampire lore and legends here in city of New Orleans, and we'll have an episode on those. 
We're going to walk up the block just a little bit, and there at 616 Ursuline is the Villa Cavento. Now, I know I don't have the, the fancy, you know, putting up the, the visuals yet. I'm working on that. I'm still learning how to do all this streaming stuff, so we're going to go old school. We're going to show you guys. You're now standing at the front of the Villa Cavento. Right there. There she is. Now, the Villa Cavento has been here since officially the building was built in 1833. And it is a Creole townhouse structure. Now, the Villa Cavento had switched hands off and on. It was a brothel for a while. Go figure. It was right there off of Gallatin Street. And it switched hands off and on. Now, originally, the building and the property that was the Villa Cavento, where the Villa Cavento sits today, was owned by the Ursuline nuns. Now, one little tag to history that I found in doing research for this story is the Ursuline nuns were not the original sect of nuns that were supposed to be here in the city. They were... What's a good way to put this politically correct? The backup team. Um, so having found that in my research, I'm going to do some more digging into that, get some more information on, on that, because it's something I hadn't heard before. But the property was owned by the Ursuline nuns in that area around the convent. And a lot of that area today, like we have the Provincial Hotel, um, uh, Beauregard Kai's house, all of that sits on what was the Ursuline convent. So when the nuns started selling that off, people bought it and started putting up houses and that sort of thing. And that's what we have here with the Villa Cavento. Now, 1833 was owned by a Frenchman by the name of John Bastille, John Baptiste Poifet. And don't shoot me for the names. I am bad with names. But Jean Baptiste was the one who built the original building that we know today as the Villa Cavento that still stands today. Now, and I've got my notes out here, so don't hold me. I'm getting old and my memory ain't what it used to be. Um, so it went through, changed hands, was a private residence for a while, then became a bordello around the 1860s. Now, keep in mind, this is the time of the Civil War. The Civil War is kicking off. Very shortly after the start of the war, the Union moved into here and took the port of New Orleans as a strategic location. And so all through that time period, it was a bordello. Now, real quick, let me describe to you how our bordellos work. Now, a lot of people hear of a term known as Shanghai. And this term became into our vernacular mostly from the Seattle area. Now, it did happen here in the city of New Orleans and a lot of our bordellos, including where the Villa Cavento is, was known for this. It was not uncommon in our bordellos for people to come in, do what you do in a bordello, and they would have people beaten, both men and women. Uh, men were being drugged, having, they would wake up, find themselves on a deck of a ship out in the middle of the Gulf of Mexico, completely stark raving naked. Um, or they were killed and their bodies were dumped somewhere on Gallatin Street. Um, and on top of that, syphilis and those diseases ran rampant through our bordellos. And this down the line will lead into a story we'll talk about when we get into talking about Storyville and our red light district here in the city of New Orleans. Now, the Villa Cavento was a bordello um, all the way up until the late 1880s when it was when Storyville took over and all of those bordellos were shut down off and in and around Gallatin Street were moved over into uh, Storyville or Red Light District. Now, if you guys get a chance to go into the Villa Cavento um, as we move up into history, um, and it says here in my notes that it was a private residence from 1902 
And then a family lived in residence all the way up to 1946 when it was turned into what we know of today as the Villa Covento Hotel. Now, if you guys get a chance to come down here, you stay here. Um, you want to stay in room 305. One of our more famous guests who has stayed at the Villa Covento, and they've actually named the room after him, is Jimmy Buffett for all of our parrot heads out there. Um, but his room is room 305. Oh. Okay, cool, cool, cool. Got that, got that, got that. Just want to make sure I'm giving you guys all the right information here. Now, it moved over in 1981 to the uh, Campo family, who still owns it and runs it to this very day. Now, the Villa Covento, if you guys get a chance to go inside, pretty, pretty hotel. Gives you a true taste of old school French Creole architecture and what the town and the city looked like back in the day. And there are some fairly intense hauntings. And if you get a chance to go into the Villa Covento, um, they'll tell you if you get room 302, which is right next to the Jimmy Buffett room, that you will be looking out over Ursuline Avenue. And then if you go to the 400 side of the hotel, you'll be looking out over the French Quarter, and it's a, it's a breathtaking view. Now, it is said that the Villa Covento is haunted, haunted by one of the former madams. Now, there's multiple stories of people going into the Villa Covento, husband and wives, those maybe not married, and being in their hotel room and partaking in adult activities and not long after they get going in adult activities hear a pounding on the door jump up run out open the door won't be anybody there get back into the mood a couple minutes later another pounding on the door now story has it legend tells that after a knock on the door a couple times if you haven't done your deed men have reported all of a sudden standing right next to the bed is a dark figure they can tell it's a lady and if they don't appropriately react to said lady they're being pushed off onto the floor now the interesting point to this piece of paranormal activity is that ladies who have been in, or in the room they're right there haven't seen anything now come to find out that back in the day when it was a bordello when your 10 to 15 minutes were up doing what you were doing the madam would come around bang on the door giving you your 10 minute warning and at the end of that 10 minutes if you still hadn't heeded her warning is when she would break into the room and make sure your time was to be done or you drop some more cash one of the two now the other thing that's been reported in the villa covento um, on numerous occasions is there was a couple one night and this is one of the more widely known and popular um, stories is that a husband and wife came in gone out enjoyed their day walking around the french quarter doing everything you do in the quarter came back in got in their hotel room, they were gonna sit down, enjoy an evening, watching TV and that kind of stuff. In the room right behind them, they heard moving around and that sort of thing. And then I'm sure a lot of us have been there, heard people having adult time in the room next door, rather rambunctiously and loudly. And so they kind of giggled it off, ah, newlyweds, must be newlyweds. And so they giggled it off, went on about doing what they were doing. So they had dozed off while watching TV. And a couple hours later, they're going at it again, loud and proud. So it was starting to get a little bit irritating. They'd bang on the wall every now and then, and it'd quiet down, quiet down for a couple minutes, and then it'd kick back up again. So the next morning, they were going to check out of the hotel, and they were down at the concierge desk and 
they made a comment about how loud the newlyweds next door had been all night. And the lady working the front desk was like, um, we don't have, have any, any newlyweds. Um, they're like, no, yeah, no, they were in their room last night. Trust me. We heard it. It's not, no, ma'am, no, sir. There is actually and can't be anybody in that room. Let me show you. So front desk took them up right next door to their room, opened up that room, and that room had actually been completely and totally gutted out and was in the process of being refurbished to the point there was sawdust over everything inside. There was no furniture. The room had been gutted. There was no way somebody had been staying in that room. So that's one of the legends and the stories that people hear there in the Villa Cavento all the time. Now, I told you guys at the start that you had heard of the Villa Cavento. He just didn't know it. Now, I'm sure some of you guys remember a song a couple moons ago called The House of the Rising Sun. Believed here in the city of New Orleans that that song, The House of the Rising Sun, in that song they are talking about the Villa Cavento. Now, there are some people out there, some historians, that have talked about that it was multiple different brothels around the city of New Orleans. Um, keeping in mind, we had Storyville, which was our red light district. You had an area on the back side of the quarter known as Smoky Row that we're going to be talking about some of the paranormal activity that has been reported along Smoky Row even to this day. Um, that's going to be another another one of our episodes. But needless to say, like I said, you guys have heard of the Vela Cavento. So the next time you hear House of the Rising Sun, you can kind of raise an eyebrow and smirk just a little bit because now you know a little bit of the backstory of that, of that story. Um, now, one woman reported in room 302 that she had actually had an apparition who had actually started to appear in room 302. Um, and so there are some of the workers there in the hotel who refused to go up into room 302 and 305, the Jimmy Buffett room, by themselves um, because of how active that room has been. Um, because I know a lot of you guys are the way you are when you come down to stay at the Villa Cavento. If you can't stay in the Jimmy Buffett room there in room 305, ask for room 209. 209 has been reported as the most haunted hotspot in the entire, in the entire house. Um, it is historically known. I don't have a whole lot of information on it. We're going to have to do some digging into it. I'll probably grab Charmaine and Toast to help me do some digging into this story. Um, but room 209 reportedly there at the Villa Cavento is where a gentleman uh, in the mid 20th century is all I've got so far committed suicide there in the bathtub of the room. And they say in the notes I have, ha have here that there's, there's not a whole lot of knowledge on it, but that the management staff reports um, hearing voices, having personal belongings moved in and around the room when nobody's been in the room. Um, the one that's really interesting to me is in the notes here, they talk about seeing a white flag hanging from the balcony of room 209. People have reported it and come in and ask, what's the white flag for? They go out, the white flag's not there. So this is another little piece of interesting paranormal that people can't can't find an explanation for it there at the Villa Convento. So that's just a small little dabble and taste in of some of the stories there at the Villa Cavento and what people have have reported. The madam is known to walk the halls. Um, a lot of the paranormal activity will show itself more to males than it will females. Um, there is a story of a gentleman who was standing in the main entryway 
and his wife was up at the concierge desk, was getting them checked in into the hotel, and he heard a female voice call his name. And he turned, he looked around, there was nobody there, he didn't see anybody, kind of scratched his head at it. Later that night, when they were in their hotel room, he heard that same female voice again, and his wife, who was right by him, didn't hear it. So one of the theories is is that he was hearing uh, the madam. Big shout out to my brother Josh, Sebastian, much love. My brother John Vest, him and I haven't seen each other since we were high schoolers. Another individual that you guys are not allowed to talk to because he has way too many stories about young me. No. So if you guys get a chance, once we get through the, the trials and tribulation that we are going through right now, uh, there's my my lovely Brittany. She's the one teaching me how to do all this streaming and stuff. So a huge shout out, shout out to her. Um, once we get through everything we have going on here, ladies and gentlemen in the country, when you get a chance, when you come back to the city of New Orleans, go down, show some love to the Villa Cavento right there at 616 Ursuline. Um, you guys have got some rooms to ask for to stay there. And just like through all of our stories, if you guys take us up on these, throw me a line if you guys hear or see stuff there inside of the Villa Cavento. We're going to be trying to set up some investigations there once we get through this. A lot of the hotels means that we have to rent a couple rooms for the night, which is cool, which means we can set up overnight and do our investigations. So be looking for those. So guys, that's going to be pretty much it today for the Demon's Tea Room. Um, hope you guys enjoyed the story of the Villa Cavento. Um, as I said, we are going to be uh, posting this on the YouTube channel. You guys can do me a huge solid by going on the YouTube channel, smash the subscribe button, sm smash that like button, hit the bell so you're notified of new episodes we have coming up. Um, and before we go today, update, not a whole lot has changed here in the hot zone of New Orleans. Um, the corridor is pretty much dead. Right now, everything is locked up. Everybody's just kind of hunkering down in place. The numbers, much like the rest of the country, are rising. Um, so things are, are pretty much status quo right now. Not a, not a huge amount has changed, and for us anyway, in the past couple of days. Um, I will, I'm gonna do this without, without shooting a tear real quick. I want to dedicate this particular episode to Brian Hell Jr., uh, who we lost two nights ago. Um, we still don't know what happened. We just know that it is a gut-wrenching, heart-wrenching loss um, to our community and our fandom. Um, if you've done any conventions along most of the southern United States or you've tuned in to This Week in Geek, uh, you heard Brian's liquid chocolate voice. And I will go to my grave hearing that voice. So, um, Brian, if you're listening, which I know you can hear me, much love and respect, brother, and we will miss you. Um, so I want to dedicate this episode of the team in Demon's Tea Room to Brian Held Jr. So, um, update, Evie's feeling much better. She uh, started to get a little bit of a cough and stuff. She was sick for a little bit, running just a low-grade fever. She is back to being her cantankerous self. Um, so she is doing good, and we will be doing podcasts and that sort of thing as we figure out how to do all of this techno weenie stuff that... I'm learning new skills in, but guys, we'll keep you up to date on what's going here in the hot zone and um, keep coming back. I hope you guys are enjoying the content. I've got a lot more. I'm trying to, you're watching this develop, develop and grow as it grows. So um, with the help of some of my fam out there, uh, we'll get this streaming thing up and going and bring ourselves into the 21st century. So, uh, 
I'm planning on starting to do a leather working channel and costuming channel, so keep your ears out for that. But guys, like I said, you can do me a huge solid. Show your love by boosting the signal. They can't stop the signal. Get the Demon's Tea Room out there. Um, let people know about the podcast and the YouTube channel. Smash that like button. Smash that subscribe button. We are going to be po putting up the Patreon page to help support what we're doing here, not only during this time of the pandemic, but afterwards, all of those funds will go to getting equipment and bringing this stuff to you guys and getting new equipment for the uh, NOPE team so we can continue to go do paranormal investigations, bringing that stuff to you guys. Um, and I'm sure there is stuff I am forgetting because there's a whole bunch of that. Let's see, let me check my notes because I'm getting old here. I got that, I got that, I got that. Yep, I got that. And I'm sure I've forgotten something, but uh, guys, be safe out there. Stay healthy. Much mad love and respect from here in New Orleans. Every single one of you guys out there are in our thoughts and prayers. So I want you guys to stay safe. That's an order. And be good to each other, y'all. We got a long way to go. And the only way we're going to get through it is with each other. So this is Captain Cedric Whitaker here in the hot zone in New Orleans here at the Demon's Tea Room. Hope you guys enjoyed your day with me. I'll be talking to you guys still very, very soon. Much mad love and respect to you guys out there. You guys are my fam. Peace out and love, y'all.